All right. Um, so where I'm coming to the methods general topic is my work has been mostly in empirical analysis and in various theories, various journals. So um, the, the breadth of analysis helped me develop some of the best practices for myself that I'd like to share uh, with you today and then see if it's contributing to the discussion on maybe pre-specification and how we can, I suppose, stand behind our empirical work. So um, this used to be much more prevalent maybe five, six years ago, but it still has the residue of, are you a theorist? Are you an empiricist? And most of you probably heard that if you're a junior person, if you're a doctoral student, you need to have an empirical paper. So push away your kind of emphasis on theory or theoretical questions aside. So, well, I mean, you might say that a theorist is thinking about what's in the head and thinking about abstract ideas and trying to make connections without touching data. And you might think that an empiricist is, yes, we'll have a theory in mind and we'll rush to the data and rush to finding variables and they know mostly OLS or structural equation modeling. So, you know, that's the world that I'm in. So I must focus on the empirical world, world versus the theory world. Now, I don't think that's very helpful in getting, getting through the review process and having a paper that can stand on its own. And when you present that can actually have something to say for people who are very knowledgeable about the theory that you are looking at or considering or using or the methods that they have used, which overlaps with what you have. So I think that's rather not helpful. So I'd like to kind of blur the, the divisions between the two perspectives and will claim, and it's also an opinion, uh, that uh, most papers will, with impact that, had, that have empirical work in it will have strong elements of theory in it. And most papers that, that are theoretical will have really the discipline of empirical thinking in it. And of course, which one is em emphasized because it's rarely will have the um, space, journal space to do both in extensive details. And that's why we have dissertations is that one of them will be the, at the forefront of what we read in the paper, but the other one will always going to be implicitly somewhere in the paper that's gonna dominate it. Now, um, just I wanna start with the observation that a theory cannot be tested or you cannot use a theoretical argument and connect to any and all empirical methods. And this, the symmetrical argument of that is obviously you can't use a method for using in the context of any and all theories that you mentioned in your paper. So there, there are trade-offs between what's the theoretical perspective that we're interested in and what kind of methods we can use for it. And vice versa, if you are really focusing on choice models where the dependent variable is uh, an indicator, yes or no, then it's, it's, that dependent variable is going to determine what kind of theoretical lenses you can kind of integrate the two together. Then if, if, you know, for one second we can agree with this premise, then the question becomes which empirical models for which theory. So there's this matching that needs to take place before we progress. So then, you know, it comes down to training, right? So, but what kind of training? Now, um, when we study theories, and most of us see this in, in our PhD classes, the way that it's taught is what are the seminal papers? What are the empirical findings that support, extend, refute, or uh, generate mixed results? So the it's very, very linear. And it's almost, you learn the theory, it's propositions, and then the empirical studies come next. And the, the identification of the empirical study is by the citations in the paper. So there's this kind of linear uh, thinking that first the idea, then the execution of testing of it. Now, I'd like to kind of expand on that idea and suggest that when we're learning the theories, especially the ones that are in management, and, you know, I'm, I have the perspective that this is an applied field, 
And most of the theories uh, are gonna have home discipline basis because you know we have people and we have firms and we have the concept of markets and profits. So all of those concepts exist in disciplines that feeds kind of feed our uh, area, but that doesn't mean we're not gonna have our own theories, but it just gives us a little bit more constraints in some sense to uh, when we're adopting perspectives to really think about what is the origin of this theoretical perspective and what is the origin and use of this method because we're not in the profession of, you know, most of us in any way creating a new empirical technique. That's not gonna be our space, but we are obligated to execute it as best as we can that a empirical uh, methods developer can look at our stuff and say, yes, you know, this, this looks like it's done well. For that, um, uh, my suggestions would be to think about the theories that we have in management in terms of the main propositions articulated in dependent and independent variables. I know that the literature in empirical studies that cites those theoretical ideas has implementations but there has to be some sort of individually developed perspective on what is the dependent variable should look like. So if you're gonna think about, for instance, transaction cost economics, then your unit of analysis is the transaction. So you have to really think about how you're gonna deviate from that and whether you should deviate from that. And if you do, what are the um, implications about the data and the methods that you're gonna end up adopting? because if transaction cost economics focuses on comparative contrasting of how to govern transactions, it's suggesting a choice. And that choice is gonna have, you know, yes, no decisions as the outcome. So that kind of immediately pulls choice models into its kind of bosom and domain. And if you're interested in that theory, you should really know very well how to manage this group of empirical models. And then, of course, it's going to have implications for the data structure. So if you're thinking about evolutionary uh, perspective, evolutionary economics, behavioral theories, and it's about change and how you respond to it, you, you really cannot have a cross-sectional data. Why? Because you can't capture change. Well, then, are you really working with that theory in terms of trying to integrate it in your empirical model? And then, of course, uh, we have, as I said, as an applied field, we have topics that other disciplines have looked at it very significantly and are currently studying it. For instance, if we're thinking about CEOs in any context, uh, we're really, um, we're, such an interdisciplinary um, topic requires that we know theories in decision-making, cognitive and behavioral, and then we really need to know from economics and uh, finance principal agent relationship um, and labor economics uh, theories based on talent based matching. And then you have the corporate governance literature in finance and accounting that looks at how the relationship between the um, CEO and the shareholders and the other stakeholders are organized the regulatory environments and other government mechanisms that substitutes or complements this principal agent relationship. Now you might say, well, I'm not gonna have any of those variables in my, um, in my study and I'm not citing any of those uh, journal articles because they're not management or they're not strategy. But here's the, even if you don't, if you omit that knowledge that's already developed, that has explanatory power, that, uh, that helps you understand the dynamics, then you're missing out pre-specification, pre uh, pre right? Chunk of the knowledge that has implications for your context is ignored. And how would that be reflected in your specific study? More than likely, you have endogeneity issues because there are dynamics that influences what you think CEOs are gonna be doing and the outcome of those uh, actions. Because all these theories are, are in some sense machinery that's working in conjunction with what you're trying to study. 
Similarly, with mergers and acquisitions, and it's my main research area also, that you have to really know what other disciplines have anything to say about this space, because in finance and economics and accounting, especially, the variables that's generated represents uh, their robust findings about the mechanisms that they think are relevant for the phenomena that we're also interested in. We don't have to try to contribute to that literature, but we have to acknowledge those mechanisms and those kind of explanatory factors and bring it in our specifications as control variables at the very least. Okay, let's see. All right, now um, that's the theory side. You might be thinking, well, if my focus is on empirical work, then why have, why have I spent too much time on the theory end? Because that helps you set everything from the beginning consistent with what you're trying to explain, right? And that's why after listening to Brandt's talk that I'm thinking uh, what I have to say contributes to the idea of implementing pre-specification. You have to know a priori your interest of in terms of the theories and the empirical specifications that have been mostly validated in the context. Now about the empirical um, empirical specifications and the research methods that we study, most of us also learn it in a very kind of isolated form. I know that in most PhD programs, we have a research methods course and we have the econometric series and we have a regression class and we have a NOAA, MANOVA structural equation modeling class. But these uh, courses focus on how you understand the actual technique. The, the, um, it, it's isolated from the context in which you're going to use these techniques. So when you're learning, you have it's on you in some sense. Uh, if it's not taught in a formalized course, that you have to articulate the concepts that you learn empirically in terms of the theories that it might really be useful for. So you're thinking about the relationships that this particular um, language of econometrics or statistics can be map mapped on. So it's almost like a translation that you're thinking about. Now, um, I'll say a little bit about endogeneity that if you think of it as a mechanical empirical problem, then I think you're missing a lot on controlling it in your setting. As I said, this is an applied field, so we have a lot more messy data, a lot more messy constructs and uh, and the nature of where we test it really matters for what we can say and explain. If that's the case, then the concern for endogeneity is going to be almost your study specific. So you have to really think through what is the unobservable, whatever that might be, wherever that might reside, is going to have an influence on my independent variables, what I'm focusing on as an explanatory factor, and what I'm looking at as my outcome. So it, it might not be um, solved by a mechanical exercise. On the same token, you know, endogeneity is not always a problem. It's a problem if it if it should infringe on your explanation because everything is endogenous in our world, right? We cannot really decompose the um, the the phenomena that we're looking at into the very very basic micro foundation. Even if we hope to, it's just not possible. Because if you're thinking about, for instance, entrepreneurship, the micro foundation of that is going to be the idea in the head of a person. So, you know, how will you kind of extract that? Maybe in the future, yes, but currently it's, it's not possible that we can control for all endogeneity. The trick is to figure out if there is a systematic influence of what we are not considering, what we're not observing. And um, I, I'm just gonna have the avoid list in terms of, and there are overlaps with what Brent is saying, and I'm sure it'll come up again in the um, two other days that you're gonna be with us. 
is that once you know a method, uh, students feel in the doctorate programs that they're kind of al almost empowered. And it creates the looking for a nail effect that if you're comfortable with structural equation modeling, then you feel like, okay, I'm done with my empirics. And then now I can test stuff. All I have to do is find my boxes and arrows and fill it in and, you know, give it to Amos and it's going to spit something back to me. But that's going to help. I mean, that's not going to help you pursue any and all research questions that you will be interested in in the future. And, and it's a long profession. You'll start with a topic and even in deviations of exploring the tangent uh, sides of that topic will require for you to know more than one method. And uh, I'm gonna echo Brandt here that complicated is less desirable to simpler if you're gonna get the same outcome in terms of what you're saying for your paper. And um, this is a little bit of something that I have to stress is descriptive analysis is underrated. If you can see it in the raw data and uh, without doing anything to it through empirical specification, then uh, it increases the robustness of your empirical specifications. It's almost like, yes, it's in the data, it's in the rough form, here it is. And this, these are the uh, much more refined descriptions through my empirical analysis that maps onto what's in the data as what we can see. Now, I'll give you an example of how to kind of think through the theory and the empirical, work, uh, empirical um, link. And Marcus, if you would let me know when, when I have five minutes, that'll be wonderful. I won't, I'm not seeing you, but if you just, um, just say it out loud, that'll be great. Yeah, that's about now. <laughs> oh, is it? Okay, so 15 minutes have gone by. Wow. So um, resource-based view, it's a neoclassical productivity-based theory. It's an equilibrium. So by definition, your data has to control for any and all shocks. Right. If the shocks are your ex explanatory variable, that's something else. But it has to not be in a. Um, it 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 should it should be almost cleaned up from shocks that that can impact the resources or the performance. Other so that you have this clean relationship between the two, as clean as possible. Of course, the theory is about relative resources and relative performance. So you're gonna have at the very least a cross-sectional data set. And um, panel is preferable because it gives you a chance to control for other firm and observables that might influence both sides, that the resource types and levels and the performance. So that would be the um, couple of bullets down. And in terms of the um, dependent variable, now relative performance, you can get at it by extracting the industry mean or median out of it. And you have to do both and show the results for both to see that they're robust. But um, you have to do that on the side of the variable, on the, on the left-hand side of all the variables as well. So I'm gonna move on from that to see, okay, from that theory, what am I gonna be using? So it's going to be mostly related to panel regression. Now there is a, also a very nice method that you can actually adopt that given all the resources, what is the frontier performance that a firm is gonna have? And then uh, each firm is placed with its distance from the frontier. So it's almost like uh, how far are you off from the frontier of what you have with your resources? And the various decomposition is the origins of this kind of uh, empirical thread that compares firms versus um, uh, industry versus um, uh, business units. So that that's the origins of where we think of resources leading to performance. And then of course, when you think about change, how you explain change in resources to change in performance, then you're talking about other theories that are in conjunction with resource-based view, and then it broadens up, broadens up the available models that you can use for your study. 
Now I'm gonna uh, let you study this and um, let me know if you have questions. It doesn't have to be today too. You can always reach out to me um, later on, but I provided in details. What I wanna kind of cover up, uh, cover in the last uh, portion is to think about if your research question is about a phenomenon. So you can actually stress it without using the jargon of any of the management theories, then it's related to a phenomenon. Then you have to ask yourself, are there any theories that, that are related to it? If it is, then it's going to be an application study, right? It's one, one I. So um, if it, you can, you can verify what the theory is saying with reasonable, um, reasonable accuracy. Of course, it's not going to be the truth because, you know, we, we, there are tons of things that we're not able to control or specify. But at least you can say that it's consistent or inconsistent. And um, you, if it's inconsistent, then it gives you a chance to see uh, where is that inconsistency resides. What's that about? Now, uh, I also want to go back to the idea that if it's not related to any management theory that you're really interested in this, for instance, Bitcoin, um, what is the management theory that's going to be related to it currently? I mean, we have resource dependency, resource based view, population ecology. You can name all sorts of behavioral perspective. If none of that is related, then you have to go back to which discipline is talking about it. Where does it reside? So if it's in economics, psychology, sociology, wherever it is, you have to go and do the learning in that literature. And then more than likely, if you can bring in the major elements into an empirical study, then you have to combine it with a management related outcome that will be of interest. Or it will be a theory paper more than likely if the gap is too far. And if it's way, way, way too distant, then you have to really think to yourself, do I really want to do this? And why do I want to do that? Now, this is something that um, can be useful to address what is the mechanism question. More than likely, especially if there's a difference in level of analysis in what we're doing, then there'll be this kind of gap between B related to C. Yes, A is related to B. I can see that. And then C is related to A. Um, a is related to B, B is related to C, but then you only have A and C. So if you can fill in that gap with existing um, theoretical and empirical work, then it, it is a plausible mechanism. It cannot be the mechanism. You don't know. You're not able to test it, but it links the idea of A and C much more concretely than just our gut that they must be related. Um, and for instance, for Bitcoin at the moment, uh, I foresee that uh, the best empirical work will be a phenomena based study and uh, Connie Halfat has a great paper on that. Now I'm going to stop here and if you have any questions related to how this is implemented, I can go over uh, my paper as an example.